Bruce, you must have something really good too. Of course I do. It's Bruce Danielson, and I guess I'm here to entertain you too. Thank you, Tom. Um, since I was the individual that encouraged our speaker to come speak to us today, he said, I better tell you something about me, only because I asked him to do that. <laughs> Uh, Charlie Johnson, is the, the first time I met him was 25 or 30 minutes ago. But we've known each other probably for over a year, maybe two years, on Facebook. And I'm so impressed with what he did uh, politically uh, on Facebook, but more than that, how he earns a living as an organic farmer. So he's going to tell us a little bit about that today. And then uh, I'm sure he's going to talk about politics, too. But let me tell you a little more about him. He's from Lake County. He was a Lake County Commissioner for eight years, from 87 to 95. He's a lifetime resident of that area, Democratic voter, of course. He's ran for the State Senate twice, once in 84 and 2012. I was up there, but we didn't get to serve because you didn't win, and I didn't either the last time I ran. <laughs> so it would have been fun if we could have been there together. Uh, he spearheaded a farm rally back when in 86 in front of the arena when Reagan came here to uh, Sioux Falls to campaign for Jim Abner. So you were kind of a rabble rouser, weren't you then even? Aren't you? <laughs> Charlie is, uh, is really, I think you're going to be impressed with it once you hear what he has to say. This morning, just this morning, on Facebook, he wrote this, and I want to share it with you. For all of you thoughtful thinking Republicans, enlightened independents, and progressive Democrats, don't let the label of democratic socialism worry you or make you less outspoken and caring. When radical legislators use that argument in order to defeat a preschool bill, then the shame falls on them. We need to find a political thread that connects all of us, regardless of party label, to bring about reasonable thoughts and policy discussions. Our state and a majority of our residents are much better than what is being portrayed in peer right now. And finally, he says, let's keep communicating and connecting. It's time to make South Dakota proud again. Thank you. <laughs> for those of you who are running for the legislature, that might be a good tagline. Time to make South Dakota proud again. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm so pleased to have Charlie Johnson from Johnson Family Farms come speak to us today. Come on, Charlie. Thank you so much for the warm welcome. It was so appreciated. And I'm so welcome to be here today. Thankful to be here with such a like-minded group. It's just tremendous that I could share some time with you. I applaud you for what you're doing and your efforts, not only today, but in the years and the months and the weeks before this and onward uh, in, the, in the future to go. As I was introduced, I'm a, an organic farmer from Madison, South Dakota. We have been organic since 1976. That was a year after I graduated from high school. Today now, uh, I farm with two brothers and a young son. We farm about 2,500 acres, 1,700 of which is tillable. The rest is in pasture and metal. We have a 200 head cow calf herd, and we raise corn, oats, soybeans, and alfalfa. I would like to share with you. A little demonstration that my late father did going back to the year that we started organic farming. He took a year of corn from a neighboring field that had all the fertilizers and herbicides that were applied at that time on that crop. There is no longer a year of corn there. And it disintegrated like that almost within a few years. 1975. He took a year of corn from one of his fields, <coughs> which never had an application of commercial fertilizer or harmful herbicides. Today, 
nearly 50 years or 45 years later, it's still a yellow piece of corn. So my question to you, what do you want your cornflakes to be made of? <laughs> this? Or do you prefer this? So that was the that was the inspiration to do something different. So everyone should have a, just a little bit of an outline. It's, it's going to help me kind of case stay on topic. Uh, we're not here at an agronomy meeting or necessarily a, a transition to organic farming meeting, but I thought maybe I could just share a little bit with you what goes on in our farm, a little bit about what it is to be a commercial organic grain farmer. Uh, here. The question comes up, what is organic farming? And I like to use this sentence uh, quite often. Organic farming is a system of farming based on soil building principles of diversity and crop rotation. As I mentioned, on our farm, we raise four major crops. Corn, oats, soybeans, and alfalfa. <coughs> we have a six-year rotation. Our rotation involves a small grain, which is the oats, as a nurse crop to underseed with alfalfa. So then in years two and three, we have alfalfa, hay, or meadow. Year four, we, we uh, convert over to soybeans. After soybeans, we, we apply winter rye in the fall. We have rye as a green manure in the spring of year five. We raise corn in year five. Year six, we go back to soybeans one more time. Year seven, we're back to the top of the rotation where we have oats underseeded with alfalfa once again. <clears throat> So we divide our tillable acres roughly the same amount of acres throughout that six-year rotation. So we're consistently raising 500 acres of alfalfa, 250 acres of corn, 250 acres of oats, and about 500 acres of soybeans. We pretty much follow that strict rotation. Our rotation also involves some simple principles. <coughs> Warm season versus cool season. Warm season is your, your alfalfa, corn, and beans. A cool season crop is a small grain like oats. A row crop, which is <coughs> corn and soybeans, versus a cover crop, which is your oats and your alfalfa. Also, there's a difference between a grass crop and a legume crop. Soybeans and alfalfa are legumes. Corn and oats are grasses. So the more that you can contrast your rotation between those different principles, the better off you're going to be in a, in a very viable and workable crop rotation. On our farm, half of our acres are basically row crops. The other half is cover crops. Now, if you've seen the landscape in South Dakota in the last 20 to 30 years, you can pretty much say it's like Iowa. It's all corn and beans, and in some say say corn, beans, and Florida. <laughs> but, uh, but anyhow, on our farm, we're quite different. We have a 50% of our farm is in what we call cover crops. Oats and, and two years of alfalfa. <clears throat> so if you remember the old movie Karate Kid, where the mentor teaches the young lad to say, wax on, wax off. Well, on our farm, it's row crops on, wax on, wax off. Cover crops, wax on, wax off. And so that's basically how we apply our crop rotation, basically on a 50-50 principle. Storage. We have to maintain, as we sell our products into an organic outlets, we have to be the warehouse for all of the things that we produce on our farm. We don't have the luxury that we can run our semis or wagons into the local uh, co-op or elevator and sell our grain right at harvest time. So we have to maintain bin storage for all the bushels that we grow on our farm. It also works better that we have numerous moderate sized bins and not just a few large ones. As I mentioned, on our farm and all the other organic farms, they grow multiple spectrum of crops. So you need different bins for different crops, and in some cases, like in a soybean, you might have a soybean that's 
you grow soybean, you grow three or four different varieties. So you need to have separate storage for all these crops and different varieties. So it works better to have a multitude of uh, moderate sized bins. Certification. USDA has what they call a National Organic Program. And under that program, there are dozens of excuse me, certified agencies across the country that are contracted with USDA to provide certification to growers and producers and handlers and, and merchandisers of organic products. And they have to go through that certification, which in turn has to be followed along USDA guidelines. But there's also standards, and most of them are, if you can imagine, are more stricter worldwide than they are here in this country. So those are standards that you're going to have to follow if you, in fact, do export organic crops to other countries. But I will let you know that in, in the demand that's been increasing every year, as, as you can read in different reports and different publications, organic sales are growing on a large percentage each and every year. And in fact, we can't produce enough organic grains in this country to fulfill the need to, to raise all the organic chickens and poultry and dairy that's in this country. In fact, we could only come up with about 30% of the corn and only 40% of the soybeans in this country with our own producers. That leads me to the next thing. We'll talk a little bit about it later here. Marketing. On our farm, we use the principle of collective marketing. <coughs> <coughs> My late father was a strong believer in collective bargaining. He was part of what I call <laughs> If you believe in the concept of collective bargaining, it's not just for yourself, but it's for everybody. That's the principle that goes by. And he as a farmer believed that we had more strength working together as farmers versus competing against each other. And so that's what we do with our marketing. I belong to what is an organization called National Farmers Organization. If you remember back to the 60s, they were, they were labeled as the real radicals, but they were the ones that really were right on. But anyhow, they have a, a spectrum or a program within their organization called NFO Organics. And so there are agents in a sales office that works on representing not just my farm, but dozens of other farms across the country and pulling that production together and then going out into the marketplace and taking the right kind of contracts and the right kind of sales that needs to be done. Fertility. We depend a lot on our rotation. I mentioned with the alfalfa, it's one of the best fertilizing crops that you can have in your rotation. We also have our cattle manure. Uh, we run that through a rough compost process. We don't call it compost, but we do run it through a manure spreader, string it out, and then turn it once again and then haul it to the field. We also have the green manure, so a lot of times in the fall with the extra alfalfa we'll mulch that in. We have the winter rye that we see after a soybean crop. We incorporate that as green manure um, in the spring. So in essence, we're trying to be our own fertilizer factory on our farm. <coughs> machinery. You'd be surprised pretty much on our farm we have the same kind of machinery that a lot of our neighbors do, less a sprayer. So, uh, <laughs> but we do use tractors, front wheel assist, loaders. What we have, what, what our neighbors don't have is rotary hose and uh, Cultivators and some of that mechanical uh, tillage that takes care of weeds. Weed control, I don't have that listed here, but uh, my marketing agent would say that uh, uh, two, successes, two key successes for an organic farmer is weed control and marketing. And he would say, We don't do weed control. <coughs> so uh, it's an ongoing um, management issue but it's one that can be captured and, and taken care of with good husbandry, good crop rotation. I know that one of the more important tools in our farm is a rotary hole. 
It's a wheel type uh, thing. And I kind of liken it to Chicago politics. You know, in Chicago, you vote early. <laughs> and you vote often. <laughs> well, with the rotary hole, it's important that you rotary hole early and that you rotary hole often. And so, anyhow. Um, livestock, we have a 200 head cow calf herd. Uh, I think on any organic farm, I think it's important to have that livestock component that can work in, in companionship with the grain farming. Uh, unfortunately, what you see a lot in South Dakota anymore is huge grain farms, but very little livestock on most individual farms. And in turn, we're turning livestock into what we call factory farm production. And we'll, we'll talk a little more about that here after a while. And Stephanie's already hit on that with Senate Bill 157. <coughs> Public relations, um, just like here today, being with you and having a chance to share our story about Johnson Farms and organic farming. Uh, we love doing that. Uh, we do have an annual farm tour. We've had it now for about four years in a row. We'll have another one on July 30th. It's a morning tour. We meet at uh, St. Peter on the Prairie, which is a former Lutheran church next to my farm. We have a little bit of workshops, and then we have an air, air conditioned bus that comes out to the farm. And we do a tour of our fields, and then we have a lunch back at the church, and by 1 o'clock, we're all done. I also have numerous phone calls that I get through the year, um, <coughs> press interviews, and uh, also an involvement with different farm organizations. Uh, presently, I serve on the board of directors with an organization called Moses. They're out of Spring Valley, Wisconsin. They put on an annual organic conference in La Crosse, which is going to occur next week. And that conference draws close to 3,000 or more people across the country. So if you can imagine 3,000 like type people, producers and farmers and consumers coming together, it's quite an event. I'm a lifelong member of Dakota Rural Action. I served as their chairperson for several years. I was also involved with an organic organization called Northern Plains Sustainable Ag Society. And I was on their board for six years, and they're based out of North Dakota. And I still carry the original membership card that my dad had back from 1962, National Farmers Organization. And I still proudly carry that in my wallet. <laughs> Future of organic farming. Um, First one I labeled there is fraud. And you would think during the Trump administration we'd have to deal with that term. <laughs> <laughs> Some of you may have uh, heard recently, and I just caught it on the news too here about a week ago, an individual out of Rap or he was tried in Rapid City uh, had fraudulently sold $71 million worth of organic grain. $71 million. He had like a $12 million yacht and a, a home in Italy. Yeah, obviously what he was doing was just taking regular grain, running it through a certification <coughs> process and a sale process, and in turn was doubling or tripling his money by claiming it to be organic. And that's where we need strong enforcement from USDA because it's their program that puts the legitimacy these organic sales. But unfortunately, we've got an administration that doesn't know what fraud is. They know what it is, but they're out there to protect them. So, so we have to keep a, an awareness on that. We also have third world countries that are bringing shiploads of grain into this country. In most cases, we can document that the number of bushels coming into this country is more than the bushels that even raise in that country, no. organic or not. <coughs> Turkey, Russia, Pakistan, you know, all these different countries. And so I mentioned that we have only about 30 to 40 percent of our organic grain being actually raised in our country, feeding our own organic <coughs> livestock. Now that would tell you on the surface that there's a potential, a great economic potential 
for our own people and our own farmers to, to meet that demand. <clears throat> Yet we're stifling it with these imports that are nothing but fraud. Or from these private individuals that are going out into the market and fraudulently using sales. So it's a big game that we've got to put a big foot on at some point. As I was selling organic corn at $13 a bushel just several years ago, when there was still a president called Obama. Today now under a president called Trump, I'm selling that same corn for $8 a bushel. So. If it wasn't organic, how much would it be? Right now, most elevator prices for conventional corn is about $3.80. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I mentioned the weakening of the standards. Uh, the other issue that we deal with almost on a yearly basis is spray drift. Spray drift. This is where herbicides from neighboring farmers come onto our land. Say what you want about herbicides. I, mean, I don't want to get into a Celtic versus a Laker mentality here, but it's still an imperfect technology herbicide usage because if you can't keep your spray on your side of the fence, it's no different than you can't keep your bull on your same side of the fence. <laughs> either way you have problems. <laughs> so that's a little bit of a synopsis of organic farming. But I'd like to share a little bit of philosophy with you. Um, I gave a talk up in St. Cloud here about a month ago. This is something I wrote back in 2011, and it's called Whisper from the Prairie. Like a whisper from the prairie, the voice of our ancestors speaks with the gentle swirl of the winds through the golden grain fields. Feel the whisper in your heart and the soil as it crumbles through your fingers. Courage provided, truth proclaimed, vision shared, listen to the whisper. I want to remind here, everyone here in the audience that the number one asset in this state, and I think nationwide, is the land itself and the bright young minds that live upon it. And so how we take care of our youth and encourage our youth and how we take care of the land and how we promote the land is going to be the number one reason why we can prosper in the future to come. I really strongly believe that we need to re-homestead this state. We need to get people back into the rural areas. <clears throat> We could either have Monsanto in our fields, or we could have kids in our high schools. But you're not going to have both. And unfortunately, we have chosen Monsanto to be our high school students. We are increasingly using C and C technology to replace human resources out in the rural areas. And it's no wonder that we don't have the small towns and the small schools anymore because we've replaced human resources that can go into those communities. Take all the arguments away about whether organic farming is better or not for your soils or better for your food. Just look at the rural sociology of it all. And I'm not necessarily saying that every farm in South Dakota has to be labeled organic. But if you have more resources that are doing the cultivating and the hay and and the hands-on stewardship that needs to go with the land, you are definitely going to have more farmers and more operators out there in the countryside. But we have increasingly said that we're going to separate those things. And it's really sad about how we have treated livestock in our recent years, not only in South Dakota, but nationwide. And we've got more and more to what we call the confinement animal feeding operations. <coughs> Those same livestock could be raised and sold and gone through our state here on multiple farms versus a handful of larger operations. In economics, there are three major components to an economic system 
It's capital, labor, and management. And the strength of the family farm for the last century has been the factor that that family provided all three. It wasn't one out of three or two out of three. That farm family provided the capital, which is the money. They provided the daily management. And they certainly provided the labor. But now what you're seeing in, in, in animal agriculture is a separation of those three economic components. You have the capitalists that are wanting to control the ownership of the livestock. They hire the upper end management. And then they use the farmer as a peon laborer. The farmer no longer owns the livestock. He's just a peon laborer. And I really think that when it comes down to it, it's just a simple concept. The people who do the chores with livestock ought to be the owners. You know, just a simple concept. <laughs> Stephanie mentioned Senate Bill 157. This is another political end-around grab by Governor Noem and her industrial friends. They've got legislation in peer now, and it's likely going to pass unless we can put some kind of a stoppage to it. That would take away local rights <coughs> to have a hearing on a sighting of a CAFO in your neighborhood. No longer will you have notice, no longer will you have the opportunity to speak out or say anything. If you do, in fact, do try to provide an appeal to that decision, by the way, it used to be a decision that required a super majority of the commission, the county commission, now it's just a simple majority. And they even got the math that if a few commissioners want to just plead sickness on the day of the, of the CAFO approval, let's say there's five commissioners and two of them are uncomfortable taking a public vote, Two of them can stay home, and the two that want the CAFO can pass it two to one. So it's just a simple majority on the day that it, the vote is taken on the Planning Commission. To appeal any decision would require you to show that you're affected. In other words, you'd have to post a bond. In other words, you have to post money to, to do your own democratic right. It's no different than a poll tax. And so all these things are being stamped on you, all in the name of industrial agriculture. And the Republicans in Pierre could play hard games. I think most of us may know Representative Kathy Tyler, very from the Millbank area. She served about six years ago. She was a very strong and vocal uh, freshman legislator. Republicans, not only in her district, but here at Sioux Falls, Sioux Falls Chamber of Commerce, other parties involved, put up money to have her defeated. Because she was obviously going to be a thorn in the side and peer for several years to come. They also cited a 10,000 sow unit a half mile from her place near Mill Bank. So she now lives under the stake of a hog farm 24-7. So, if you don't think it can happen to you, it will. It really will. So, I have a question. Yes. Uh, that first jar you have there, yes. very dramatically. Mm -hmm. uh, what would be the average cost for the average farmer to put that poison herbicide and uh, chemical fertilizer down uh, on the ground uh, each spring? Today, no? Yeah. Today, for instance, what would be the extra cost? Well, I don't know that exactly because it's been 45 <laughs> years since I bought it. So. <laughs> All I know is it's expensive. But uh, the irony is, isn't it, that they're paying a lot of money for it. Right. Then there's drift. Right. And then, um, and then they get uh, bigger yields that depress the that depress the prices. Well, they don't. I, I think there's a misnomer there. Uh, again, it's a lack of, of understanding. For one thing, good organic farms can yield just as good or more than any conventional farm. You know, this premise that you can't be a good producer on organic farms, that's neither here. 
What is attractive about using herbicides and fertilizers and larger technology and equipment is that it gives you the bragging rights that you can farm more acres. And so there's a lot of operators that are out there that are operating on eagle and money and acre size. It has nothing to do with husbandry and, and being a prudent operator. So, and it goes back to, even in the conventional markets, the lack of a strong collective bargaining aspect, even to conventional farming, it's basically a premise that I take whatever's offered and I go broke. Yeah. My late father went into collective bargaining with the aspect that a surplus should be a blessing, not a curse on the market. And so that the market should reflect a profit back to the operator to the extent that the, that food can be utilized and sold. And anything that was so-called considered a surplus would then be purchased by the profit that was made by the other 90% to in turn to make sure that the hungry and the weak were fed day in and day out. So that we no longer had starvation amongst the poor and we had economic ruin for the farmers. But we were all both in the same game. Yes? If you wanted to expand your farm, what do you have to do to the land to make it organic? Okay. A good question. The question is how do you make acquiring new land organic? Uh, the basic premise is that you have to be away from uh, harmful chemicals and fertilizers for three years through your waiting period. You also have to provide your certification agency a what we call a soil building program. So you can't just say, well, I'm going to go corn and soybeans and still call myself an organic farmer after three years. For one thing, if that's all you're going to use for rotation, you're not going to be very successful after a few years. And so you do have to show a rotation in a, in a, in a stewardship program on your farm that's going to provide a good resiliency, a good yields, and weed control, and such. There's also just a small, well not, it's not a small component, but it's actually a component of organic certification. It is how you treat your farm and how you treat your labor. There is some standards in certification that you're not to make a success out of organic farmer, farming by brutalizing or using cheap labor. That's a standard. Same thing on diversity or landscape on your farm, it's highly encouraged within your certification that at least 5 to 10 percent of your land <coughs> has what they call uh, environmental friendly aspects, whether it be shelter belts, metals, filter strips, things like that. So, question here? Yes. Would you be Outstanding. willing to eliminate green belting? That's the policy of which the assessed value of agribusiness land is substantially lower than, for instance, my house and, and every homeowner shares a larger burden of the real estate taxes where agribusinesses are subsidized by lower taxes. In other words, I'd be willing to sell my house at assessed value. Would you be willing to sell your farmland at assessed value? I don't know if everybody heard his question or statement uh, going on a tax policy question. <coughs> It is true that, that bare and land is, is levied at a different rate than versus land within a town or your lot or a farm home or even an acreage home. Uh, that, that, that's not, not on the county or township levy, but it's with the general education levy. Uh, problem with property taxes is the fact that we're financing public education with pro with real estate taxes. That's the issue. Yeah. If we had real estate taxes only providing funds for county, townships, and perhaps the capital outlay levy for schools and construction, we'd have a more fair tax system. But what we really need is to have public education in the state financed by its own revenue source. And I would call for a no more than 2% Right? Not a tax, but a tax levy on all income in this state. And that'd be the strictest. 
once you once you achieve, you set that aside in its own money trust fund. It's not part of the general fund. And it finances education, going back to the Jankel years in 1995, where we do follow a law that we do provide either 3% or less of the inflation rate. We provide each student in each school district in the state a level of Chevy ownership in education so they can do what they need and want, but we don't rely on property taxes and property owners to finance that. In turn, property owners and property taxes can be focused on infrastructure locally, which is good jails, good roads, bridges, uh, things of that nature. And also the local school district can also use it for their own school buildings and their own capital outlay. So what happens is when we put the pressure and the burden continually on property taxes, it makes everybody angry. And everybody's looking at somebody else and they're getting a deal and I'm not. But we can get back to a taxi system with property where it only provides benefit <coughs> to local infrastructure, which is your county and your townships. You're a lot better off. Talk about ethanol and biodiesel. I assume that organics don't go into that market. Yeah, I know. What's your opinion about ethanol and biodiesel? Okay, the question is, what is my opinion of ethanol and diesel? My own personal opinion is, is that with ethanol, I'm afraid we end up using almost as much energy producing that so-called green fuel that we do and what we get out of it. If we really wanted to utilize all those extra bushels that are going into ethanol today, I'd rather see a system where those acres and those bushels were being utilized back on the land and providing that decent crop rotation. So we weren't growing, so we're not growing soybeans and corn on every single acre in South Dakota, where in fact we've got green manures, cover crops, mulches that are going back in the soil. So we're feeding our soils rather than feeding our cars. <laughs> yeah. And make it utilized that way. Question here? Yeah. Go ahead, Ray. Well, we had the same one. Would you contrast what you're talking about with what's called no-till farming? Do you do that or not? Okay, the question is, do we do no-till farming? There is certain operators that are probably far more successful than I am that are trying to use no-till principles in their organic aspect. Uh, for those that may not know, no-till is where you try to avoid any or all usage of uh, mechanical equipment on your ground. With our farm, we try to minimize it. Um, you know, I, I like to, to think that, you know, when, we, when I mentioned the cover crops on 50% of our land, we don't have row crops. So at least 50% of the time on our farm, we don't do mechanical tillage on our land. It's having a chance to be in metal, uh, put up the hay, uh, do it that way. Uh, it's hard to say. I know that, that a lot of people are promoting no-till, and I, I, in a way I applaud that. But in most cases, or in all cases, they're using herbicides to do the kill down of weeds and other things. I was watching MSNBC this morning, and Trump came on and said today that since the tariffs are coming in such a huge amount of money, that he's going to help fund the farmers again with another bailout. Yeah, that's what he said today. So how does that affect you? In, in your operation, and how has it helped you when you're labeling your meat for sale? Because I'm sure you've got organic beef too, right? Well, we sell beef on our farm as private treaty, but there is co ops that do market organic beef. The whole thing with the Trump money is, is that we have turned farmers into welfare recipients. And it's kind of amusing that we, we, uh, we label the, the likes of Sanders and Warren as socialists, when in fact there is no, no community more socialistic and taking in money than farmers. Yep. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm one of them, okay? <laughs> Probably, in most cases, in fact, it's proven that out of the, the, the net income of all farmers across the country is about $60 billion. Just the Trump money, that doesn't even talk about subsidized crop insurance, is $28 billion. So almost every 50 cents of every dollar spent by your farmers in your community 
on groceries and cars and clothing all came through Trump money. Yep. Just awesome. imagine that. I read an article, and I commented that on Facebook here a week or so ago. Uh, a story was covering some farmers out of Northwest Iowa. And, you know, they're good Democrats over there. <laughs> they love their $15,000 land and, and such. Uh, they said they never had it so good. 2019. And they're all Trump fans. But you know, when your mailbox is your farm program to obtain more <laughs> revenue, I guess it, it works out that way. And most of them would say, most of those, honest, those farmers, honest with themselves, and, and their lenders will say it too. If it wasn't for the Trump money, most of them would be showing losses for 2019. So we're not just subsidizing farmers a little bit. We're subsidizing them to the extent that they'd be losing money otherwise to the point that they've never had it so good in a given year. That's how much we're subsidizing them. <coughs> do you do tiling? Yeah, the question is, do I do tiling? Yes, I do. I mean, and how does it work with the being organic? I've, I've seen some damage done by my at my parents' farm down in Clay County from some of the tiling that's going on there, and I wondered how it helps with your erosion and et cetera. You know, you can talk about tiling for a whole afternoon here. Um, <laughs> done right, I really think tiling can be good because what it does is it takes the, the high water table away from your soils. And so, in fact, when you do have heavy rains, more of your soils are available to take in the rain on off times, and, and a tile outlet actually excuse less water in a given time than, than having all that rain come off the top of, of the soil. So good tile in a good organic field absorbs a lot of the rain, so in turn it doesn't allow for that over the land erosion. I know Thomas. One more question if you want. One more question one more. here. Do international markets appreciate the organic nature of what you, their organic farming, like the U.S. markets. The, the markets? Yeah. Well, as I indicated earlier, the, the demand and the growth of the organic sales is, is increases exponentially. Worldwide? Over, yeah, worldwide. Yeah. In other countries, they're far more ahead than we are already at this point. And, and good food, and not just good food, organic food, but also local food. You know, I want to just promote Stephanie here, but what she's doing here with the fruit of the co-op, or you know, it, you know, using local eggs and such, you know, we just need more components like that in our food production system. Okay, well, we need to wrap up. We want to thank Charlie. Uh, and, uh,